Welcome everyone uh, to another one of our Foresight Neurotech group uh, keynotes. And today we've got here Dr. Chris Own, uh, whom I know quite well since I'm working in his company. And um, we've actually known each other for quite a while. Uh, Chris is probably one of the top five best people in the world when it comes to uh, electron microscopes and both their design, their development, build, improvement, uh, how you get the best data out of it, all of it. Um, and I, I've known him since uh, around 2010, back when uh, we were both at this other startup, Halcyon Molecular, and he was already spearheading the development of some fantastic new EM technology, which I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about. Um, and I'm very glad that he was able to take a lot of that forward uh, after the Halcyon experience into his new company, Voxa. And uh, I guess uh, with that, I will open up the floor to Chris. Thanks very much, Randall. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, really delightful to um, uh, interface with uh, some new faces and uh, share some of what we've been doing um, and also see some old faces here um, as well. And, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for, for um, um, some of the folks here. Uh, such as Ken and, and uh, Randall as well. So, and um, we're, we're excited to uh, continue pushing things forward. Um, so um, just uh, before I start, in case there's any sort of communications issues, um, you know, I'm doing this from a hotel uh, in Japan. Um, and so if uh, there's any um, uh, cutouts or anything like that, I'm happy to switch over to a, a, a different um, cell link. Um, and hopefully that, that would make things a little nicer. Uh, if there's any cutouts. So just let me know, inter interrupt me if, if there's any issues. Um, otherwise, I'll get going. <clears throat> okay, so let me share my screen here. <clears throat> okay. All right, so um, the, uh, the title of uh, this uh, presentation is uh, Toward Whole Brain Circuit Maps. And um, uh, we're sharing information about um, some scalable platforms uh, in ultra high throughput uh, nano imaging um, that uh, we've been working on. And this is a family of technologies um, that uh, um, a specific uh, variant of a family of technologies. And um, you know, I see Ken here in, in the chat and he's, he's been working on a, another variant of it. And it's a really, really exciting and burgeoning field. And, and there's been a lot of progress in the last 10 years on this. So. Um, happy to share some some, some of uh, uh, you know our our, our observations uh, uh, during this journey. Uh, so I'd like to open with a simple um, quote from um, Lord Kelvin, the Venerable Lord Kelvin, and this, this is uh, stated in only the way a uh, um, 1800s uh, Lord could say it, uh, and and this is on measurement. He says, um, I often say that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the state of science, whatever the matter may be. <laughs> um, so that's um, pretty sobering. But um, uh, what he was really saying is that you get what you measure. So um, pick what you're measuring carefully, and um, you may be rewarded with a feast um, for um, uh, of knowledge and understanding. Um, so, um, as far as measurement, um, you know, he lived during a time, and maybe a little bit before that, uh, when it was incredibly um, uh, important to to learn a certain type of information, um, and that uh, and uh, make certain kinds of measurements, um, and that was in uh, in uh, mapping new territories. And so during the Renaissance, um, uh, shipbuilding and um, exploration and um, uh, clock building uh, was the uh, technology du jour. And uh, during that uh, age of exploration, um, people were making maps, and they were just uh, critical because um, the uh, uh, the benefit was that um, uh, when uh, you are able to um, uh, acquire information about territories um, 
and uh, you know specifically visit the the individual areas um, in these uh, far off lands. It enabled people to you know revisit um, those later. It enabled people to understand what the resources were there and understand how um, you know groups uh, or animals or uh, resources uh, flowed in in those regions. And also gave understanding of um, you know information about passability and uh, you know opened up trade routes and information flow. So, um, in the case of um, neurotechnology and, and neuroscience, um, what we see in terms of opportunities are the potential for elucidating huge variability within natural systems. You know, we are all individuals, and um, uh, there's tons and tons of variability, but also lots of similarities. And we're looking for you know, uh, novel patterns, hierarchies, you know, and using that as a baseline on which to, you know, develop new things such as, um, you know, therapies um, and um, informing new models of organization and computing. <clears throat> and um, I, many of us are probably familiar with, uh, with the work of Ramoni Cajal. Um, and um, this is just to set the stage for, you know, this new type of map making of, of our current uh, uh, time. And, um, you know, when I first saw these, I was just uh, absolutely enthralled. Um, you know, he was, uh, um, he's considered the father of modern neuroscience. And, you know, at the time he dreamed of being an artist in his youth, um, but his father wasn't into that. You know, he said, okay, you gotta do something more useful, more effective. And so he, um, uh, his father, um, in, in deference to his father, he, uh, he took up a scientific career and um, he combined his, his understanding of, of art um, and artistic methods um, and using the methods of Golgi to stain uh, neurons, he identified a huge diversity of cell types. So um, m many of these insights and conclusions uh, on structure and function are valid to this day. And, and it really just emphasizes, um, you know, the importance of uh, being able to, uh, you know, go there and see it and then report it to, to everyone else. And, um, you know, we, we all know that the brain is an incredibly complicated uh, system and uh, there's a lot of places to go look. And um, we need to do that very efficiently. So um, let's talk about um, uh, you know how how we get to technologies for for making uh, extremely um, uh, effective and and complete maps. Um, so uh, just a little bit about us uh, as a company. Um, and uh, Randall mentioned that uh, some of our technology came out of a, a, a gene sequencing startup in the Bay Area called Halcyon Molecular. And um, um, we, we, we were working there on extremely fast uh, TEM based imaging of uh, direct imaging of um, nucleotides, um, tag nu nucleotides in, in particular. Um, and so since then we've, we've uh, had quite a, an interesting meandering path and um, our, our core is to, um, our, our core value is to, to create next generation technologies and, and uh, work to commercialize them. So there's a, a few really nice um, uh, feathers in our caps. Um, we uh, um, developed the first portable scanning electron microscope. It's about the size of a uh, coffee machine. And um, uh, down here in the bottom right corner, you can see it. Um, th this one won the um, Microscopy Today uh, 2018 um, Innovation Award. Um, we have also sent that SEM into space and it's on the ISS right now. It's the first EM in space. Um, we also participated in um, producing the first and largest synapse level brain map uh, that's the cubic millimeter IARPA data set. Um, and uh, that, that I think is the largest data set to date. Um, and um, finally, we, we also um, uh, produced some of the first EMs that are regularly used by grade school classes to inspire future scientists. You can see here uh, some members of our team and uh, Randall here, uh, number three down here uh, on the right hand side. Um, and just a little plug for our ISS work. Um, this is uh, now a national laboratory facility. Uh, the, the device has been proven out. You can go on YouTube and uh, look at videos of it uh, in action. Uh, there's some, some really fun stuff, like we uh, imaged a, a Martian meteorite, the one that actually started the Mars program. Um, and uh, we took it and sent it back up to space and imaged it in space and verified that we can actually do that. So that's really exciting for future exploration like to the moon and Mars. Okay, so um, let's uh, uh, move the theme onto the technical side of uh, uh, what, what we've been able to, um, uh, to build to, to try and um, uh, serve an anatomical neuroscience and take it into, into the, next, uh, uh, to the next level. Um, so um, this area I, I call um, ultra high throughput TEM 
And, um, you know, in, in microscopy, everybody's always trying to one up each other. And so there's always these uber and ultra and, uh, you know, the various types of uh, qualifiers. Um, and everybody's been really focusing on resolution to date, but um, uh, nobody really has been working on uh, improving the time, uh, things in the time domain. And um, that, that was very, very interesting to me. And, and uh, you know, at Halcyon Molecular, we had to work on that um, and, and uh, try, try and change things uh, from the status quo. And that's been a very, very interesting area to work in. Um, so uh, um, it, the, the specific area we've been focusing um, to date is in uh, synaptic level cortical neuroanatomy. And um, uh, this is also uh, you know, a, a place where uh, uh, folks like Ken Hayworth uh, have, have been working for a long, long time and, and have been very inspirational uh, for, for our work. Um, so what, what we're looking for here is 3D volume reconstructions of cortical tissue at the synapse level. And so uh, it's really unclear what synapse level actually means. Um, but it looks like it's, you know, at least the consensus in, in, the, um, in the field is something around uh, four nanometers resolution and maybe going down as, as small as two or one. And that, that looks at uh, things like uh, synaptic uh, gap junctions. Um, you know, these things are really, really small membrane um, uh, interfaces. And uh, we're also interested in where are the proteins and, you know, what, what are the neurotransmitter types and, you know, are they... Um, um, uh, 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 um, you know, the various types of flavors um, that have been identified and also looking at new types. Um, and then on top of that, looking at uh, organelles and uh, different types of uh, uh, substructures that uh, most definitely play into the communications uh, between neurons. Um, so uh, the, the most important uh, challenge here is the volume, because when you go down in resolution or up in resolution, which is smaller in size, uh, when you're looking at volumes, um, the, the amount of data you have to process is, uh, uh, goes as a cube of the distance. Um, so um, at the moment, um, we, we've made huge strides in, in the last uh, decade or so, but really we have barely scratched the surface and there's a long way to go. Um, so the solution we've been working on is uh, called Blade and uh, this uh, modality um, is uh, the TEM-based modality, so this is transmission electron microscopy. Uh, it's been quite popular to use uh, scanning electron microscopy for the last uh, two decades or so. Um, and uh, um, what we're um, what we we discovered at um, Halcyon Molecular uh, by looking at different types of modalities was that really TEM to us was the most scalable uh, approach. And um, and so um, taking that idea forward. Um, we uh, have uh, made the sort of first uh, uh, commercial realization of that and uh, are, are um, you, you know, have started demonstrating scale for this. Uh, so the, the main features are that it's um, um, fast, sensitive, and has uh, multiple types of modes. Um, the speed uh, in particular, um, and this is applicable to other markets as well as uh, neuroscience, um, we can deliver 500 samples per hour and the machine is fully automated. And our sampling rate is uh, incredibly fast. It, it exceeds 350 megapixels per second. And uh, this is average speed. And, um, and so this is not burst speed. Um, and so from time to time, you'll, you'll maybe hear larger numbers like a gigapixel per second. And there's different types of like semiconductor mapping uh, hardware that can go, go a little bit faster. But uh, what we've really focused on is sustainable numbers and, and how fast can we actually go on average. And so uh, it's been pretty exciting um, to, to, to really try and push this. And, um, and so th this is the, the number that we advertise um, as uh, our capability for the current product offering. Um, what's great about uh, TEM is uh, it's um, uh, pretty high resolution and it's pretty easy to get the resolution uh, down to about one nanometer. And that allows us to see uh, things like vesicles, organelles, synapses, active bodies, and we can vary the uh, resolution continuously. Um, and uh, there are various uh, targeted modes um, um, as well as general imaging modes. So um, right now everybody's looking at uh, sort of a, a general negative stain. Um, and so there's, there's some really nice ones uh, out there um, like Roto and um, uh, you know, uh, various uh, uh, like osmium um, uh, or uranium-based stains. Um, and then there's uh, another class that nobody's really been working very much in, um, but we think it's a very interesting place to be, uh, which is to look at mo molecular probes for targeted studies. And that, that's really exciting for messaging and uh, you know, uh, states that are more like chemical states rather than physical states um, of, uh, you know, positions of neurotransmitters, et cetera. Um, 
And uh, I think what's really cool about what we do is that I, I think at the moment we're the only um, system uh, at, at the highest speeds here that can operate uh, 24 seven uh, and, and uh, operate overnight. So uh, that gets us the extra shift um, at night, which is really hard, hard to do for some of these sophisticated instruments. And so um, we, we can r routinely scan uh, tens of thousands of brain tissue sections in, you know, in, on the course of several weeks. So, um, you know, the, the process is to stick, um, uh, a huge number of thin tissue slices onto, uh, conveyor belts and, uh, operate those, um, operate in those and, and get the images, um, uh, continuously over the, the course of maybe, uh, you know, three weeks to, to, to a couple months. Okay. So let's, um, move to, uh, the, uh, the concept of scale when it comes to this type of instrument. And this is really um, common thinking in terms of uh, technologies like um, uh, gene sequencing, but not so much in electron microscopy, which has to date been like a, um, you know, an expensive single instrument with a, with a, you know, a PhD or postdoc user who's highly, uh, highly skilled and highly trained uh, at, at operating the instrument. Um, so um, where I come from, um, uh, some of my background has been in, uh, you know, material science and, and uh, um, in, in uh, crystallography space. And um, I, I worked quite a bit in supercomputing, um, doing ab initio calculations. And I had built, built some supercomputers in my graduate studies. And, um, and so that really set me up to think about, uh, you know, what, what it takes to take, a, you know, capital equipment like uh, an electron microscope and really scale it. Um, so, uh, in, in the case of computing, everybody's quite familiar with this and, and it's interesting because everybody used to use mainframes in the old days and in, in the sixties, uh, and then it switched to personal computing and, and now it's kind of, kind of, kind of going back to, to, to mainframes and cloud computing. So, um, uh, here we can kind of give a, um, uh, a comparison between what, a, you know, a con conventional sort of, sort of single user type of instrument is like versus a pipeline ultra high throughput. Uh, parallelized system. Uh, so, in on the left hand side, uh, uh, you know, they're typically smaller studies are possible. Um, the experiments tend to be kind of one off experiments, and in general, one sample must represent uh, all the samples. And in material sciences, this is really easy to do, but uh, in biology, this is uh, completely the wrong way to go about it. Um, uh, also, the specialist labor uh, in the conventional case that provides methodology and art in operating the instrument. Um, and uh, in general, the person has to be uh, in person. It's it's very efficient if the person's there. Um, and in the case of pipeline ultra high throughput, and in this case, we're talking servers uh, in the computing space. Um, in general, it's scalable, and what that enables is uh, you know anywhere from small to large studies um, possible. Uh, one can do combinatorial experiments, so you can do longitudinal variations, um, uh, re re repeat experiments. Um, and also do cross-system studies, uh, you know, across multiple individuals, uh, across multiple species, and that's much much harder to do in the conventional case. Um, also, in, in the uh, uh, ultra high throughput case, uh, you would look at many samples and look at them as a system rather than, um, you know, having one sample represent all samples. Um, and in the case of labor uh, for these final two here, um, the specialist labor changes from, uh, you know, the art of operating the instrument to workflow design and increasing acquisition uptime of the system. Um, and in order to facilitate that, one starts thinking in terms of fleets where uh, the machines are remote operated and cloud managed just like servers in the cloud. And so in this case, you know, on the left-hand side here, this is a classic instrument to Joel uh, 2100 to, to, to uh, I think it's a, maybe a 2000, uh, 200 kV microscope. Uh, that's the, the old way of doing things. And uh, on the right-hand side, uh, there's one of our systems uh, blade systems uh, put, put onto a, an electron microscope. This is a cutaway, so you can see the inside. Um, and this is now software and cloud operated. So um, when we start thinking about, um, you know, this, this sort of uh, uh, parallelized, highly parallelized, high throughput uh, pipelines uh, work uh, uh, system, uh, workflows become incredibly important. And, uh, you, you know, because uh, you're setting up an experiment to go for uh, a long time, sometimes months at a time. Uh, you have to spend a lot of time thinking about what what type of experiment you're going to do. And um, the the way we think about it is um, is the conversion basically of atoms into bits um, in a very pipelined way. And so um, there's two segments to the workflow here. Um, and uh, uh, 
uh, this this is uh, I, I think quite the standard in 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 our industry. Um, so uh, the, the first part is the physical side, so that's a preparation pipeline, um, and uh, the second side is the digital side, and that's that's the analysis pipeline. And uh, we can think of the microscope fundamentally as a transducer. It's just an atoms to bits converter, and uh, and so um, on on the one hand on the feed side, uh, you have to get everything right so that uh, on the uh, um, on the sink side, on, on the consumption side, um, that uh, the representation represents actually what you want to um, capture in terms of information. So we start on the left from you know a brain uh, volume, um, the, that se uh, a, a section of the brain that's pulled out, or you know now we're moving towards whole brains. Uh, this is thin sectioned and then deposited onto some sort of substrate media. And in this case of uh, the blade product, uh, it's um, a, uh, uh, a tape reel. Uh, really similar to, um, you know, uh, uh, audio tapes, you know, from from, from the old days, uh, or um, uh, or from movie, movie reel, and then that's thrown into a, a capture system, and uh, that's our transducer that converts it into bits. Uh, all that data goes into data store, gets montaged, and then uh, reconstructed, and then ultimately uh, reconstructed in a model. And uh, what's really important here is that um, the the uh, um, data density is incredibly high. And so this data cannot be processed by humans anymore. It's so large. We're talking uh, right now. We're in the petascale, and we're moving towards exascale, and uh, that's where uh, machine learning really has to come in. So uh, on this back end here, machine learning is incredibly important. Okay. So um, one one point um, that that's really important to uh, consider is uh, you know why TEM and uh, why, why we chose TEM as as the approach. Um, as I mentioned, SEM is really important um, and, and has opened up this field uh, significantly, and everybody's been using it uh, for a long time. Um, but uh, we think TEM is, uh, is the way to go in the future. Uh, and the reason is um, we, we think it's uh, much more scalable. Um, and uh, currently, it's setting the, the benchmark. And you know, maybe the other technologies will, will uh, kind of leapfrog us. Uh, but, but I think ultimately, we'll, we'll um, um, uh, be able to exceed uh, the, the performance at scale. Uh, from a cost per voxel or cost per brain volume uh, standpoint. Uh, so just to go down the list a little bit here, um, just, just a few of the, the highlights. Um, for, for TEM, the resolution is really high in XY, and uh, that, that's in the XY plane uh, of a thin section. Um, it's converis, uh, continuously variable between five angstroms and 10 microns generally. Um, and it's, uh, uh, in my experience, easier to get high resolution than uh, field emission scanning electron microscopy. Um, it's extremely fast because it forces you to have a tiny staging volume, which means that the staging is extremely lightweight, uh, which really translates to speed very quickly. Um, there's also uh, parallel sensors um, that are made from um, uh, an external industry um, uh, to electron microscopy, which is really a small cottage industry. And what's great about that is that they're always improving in speed and density. So you kind of get things for free there. It's uh, kind of like how in gene sequencing, the um, uh, cost uh, per base kept going down because bioinformatic um, uh, computation kept going down uh, in price, and so it just get, kept getting easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper um, to, uh, to 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 do uh, complex uh, uh, reconstructions. Um, and uh, that's you know that that boon came from an outside industry from from the main industry. Um, and uh, a few other things, um, the spread electron beam and TEM because of parallel elimination uh, makes things less sensitive to charging. So you don't dump all that charge into, into one place and try to handle it. Um, and um, in, in the current state, um, and, and uh, some SEM techniques also have the ability uh, to do re-imaging, but uh, in general, TEM uh, methods, because it's archival media, uh, is really forgiving of mistakes. So if you go and image something wrong, you can go back and re-image it, or if you want to image it, initially at low, low magnification uh, to get a lot of information initially, um, then get way more information later at high resolution, you can do that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then uh, there's sort of lots of room, headroom for this, uh, this way uh, of doing things to grow. Um, now, uh, each technique also has disadvantages, of course. So in uh, TEM, uh, you know, this is a transmissive uh, technique. And uh, even though it has higher resolution in X and Y natively, uh, it has much lower resolution in Z. So um, uh, nominally, that's limited by how thin you can slice the tissue. And uh, so the, um, 
thickness range uh, generally is uh, 30 to about 100 nanometers in Z. Um, and SEM has, a, has the, the advantage there right now because uh, the, uh, uh, the depth sectioning is, is around uh, five nanometers in resolution in Z. So um, one might get projection artifacts and confounding views. And um, that, that I think is um, uh, still sort of up in the air as to uh, what, uh, what, whether or not that gives us all the information we need uh, or not. Um, but um, I do think it's solvable. Um, and then finally, um, the, the, the big, you know, the sort of elephant in the room is really that the samples of TEM are incredibly fragile. Um, but I think that can be solved with management. Um, and so, so far we've been able to re-image tissues and it's uh, pretty archival media. And we've been able to uh, re-image, uh, you know, 100 or 200 times the, the same tissue. So um, as long as uh, one is fairly careful, I think this, this can be managed. Um, the, the most difficult part is the sample preparation side in order to make the, the samples reliably. Um, and there's, you know, there's problems for both SEM and TEM methodologies in terms of how do you section an entire brain? There's, there's this whole field uh, uh, challenge uh, called subsectioning, which is uh, how, do you, how do you make the blocks that you turn into the thin sections uh, and how do you connect the blocks together? And, and at the moment, we don't know how to do that yet, but I'm hopeful that will be solved. Okay, so um, let's switch now to some demonstrations of uh, the performance of the system. And uh, um, I have a few YouTube videos here. Let me see if I can bring them up and I'll share the screen. Um, here. Okay, so uh, this, this is um, data that's coming in um, at a rate of about 350 megapixels a second. Um, each of these tiles that's coming in, they're called super tiles, they come in at uh, 250 megapixels uh, every 0 0.8 seconds, I think. And here, here they come in and uh, um, they're scanning this area on the right hand side here. Um, this is a 1.1 by 1.1 millimeter squared. And this is what one of the uh, thin sections looks like. Um, when we zoom in, and this is at a resolution of something like, I don't know, four to six nanometers with a very heavy stain. So um, nowadays people are getting much finer processes. Uh, and in re reconstruction, this is um, uh, work done by Princeton um, on uh, the cubic millimeter. Um, we can look at uh, the interaction intersections between uh, neurons and uh, identify synapses and uh, look at the space filling properties of cells. And um, you know, so far there's been so, uh, quite a lot of interesting results coming out uh, about cell types and um, different uh, types of uh, um, you know, cross studies that one can do at high resolution um, in addition to the sort of uh, tracing studies um, of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, volume reconstruction um, and, and uh, co connectomic uh, connectivity. Um, okay, so... Uh, I'm going to move on to um, some of the methodologies for increasing speed from such systems. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation here. Um, so part of the reason why we can go so fast um, is, uh, uh, you know, large sensors and um, operating uh, with parallel acquisition, and then also arraying multiple TEMs. So um, that data set was acquired with six TEMs in the fleet. Um, and, uh, you know, at any given time, one or two of the TEMs is down, but uh, if that's the case, then you just move the reel to another microscope and pick up where you left off. Um, and, uh, but each of the microscopes also has uh, additional headroom to reach higher speeds. Uh, and so we, we developed this really neat um, uh, um, beam jumping uh, methodology, um, and it, it's embodied in this product called the Cricket. Um, and this is a, um, a, a way of, eliminating the latency overhead from physical stage motion. Um, so just to uh, give context here, when you're moving um, and you're taking one frame, you uh, have to move in the, this is a pink area with the, the diagonal lines, and then you take your picture, which is the green with the polka dots. And uh, nominally, it's about 100 milliseconds for each one, or maybe 200 milliseconds. So here, you know, I, I show five frames, this is um, uh, 100 milliseconds each. And um, what's 
really sobering here is that your microscope is literally sitting still and not being used for half the time. So 50% of the time, 50% of the, the dollars that you spent on that microscope is being wasted, uh, just sitting there, not getting data. And so um, what, uh, what's really important is to try and get that data back. Um, and uh, uh, we, we found a way of doing it by kind of combining uh, SEM a little bit with TEM. And so in this case, what we do is we actually scan the beam, uh, we move the stage, and then we scan the beam and uh, get a lot more frames so that uh, stage moves are very, very short. And so we already have very short um, step and settle times for the stage already. But um, on top of that, the, the beam moves incredibly quickly. And uh, so we can basically fill in all the space where the um, uh, microscope was sitting idle pre uh, previously. And so uh, today, we've actually clocked incredibly high speeds, uh, up to 500 megapixels a second. And that's a sustained rate. So uh, pr pretty sweet to see that in action. Um, so I'll show um, some advantages of, of doing this. Um, so here is uh, another video of, um, of a low magnification application of this tech here. OK, can you guys see the video? So um, in, in this case, uh, this is just an a image on a phosphor screen of the tissue section eliminated. And the width here is, uh, I think, one and a half millimeters by two millimeters. And uh, the tissue section is this, um, you know, this sort of trapezoidal looking thing here and, and then the fill space here. Um, and what we're trying to do is uh, just image the whole thing really quickly and um, uh, for, for a survey. And so we can do surveys here on the order of two seconds and then translate the sample. And so this is really the boon here is the ability to move samples in and out of the microscope incredibly quickly. Um, and, uh, and then on top of that, get, uh, get the imaging with ex uh, extremely low downtime. And, um, and so what, what we've been able to do um, that uh, I, I think has given, given us a, a big step forward um, is to uh, reduce the time that the microscope is sitting idle and maximize the time that we're acquiring pixels. And so what that looks like is this. So this is um, the pictures that are acquired. And these are pretty low resolution. So these are like 10 micron resolution uh, overview images. But uh, each of these was captured within four seconds. And then this is going forward and then back and then forward and back, proving that um, the, you know, we have this ability to look at these samples again and again. And uh, these are pretty old uh, you know, test samples. So you, you see cracks in them. And, um, and some of these are torn. But, um, um, but the potential uh, to, to, to do um, you know, high speed acquisition at lots of different length scales in the electron microscope with a sensitivity uh, is demonstrated here. So this, this is pretty long. This is 2,500 samples. But uh, you can see that each of these is an individual layer. Um, and uh, uh, you know, when, once you zoom in and, and acquire the, the whole millimeter squared from each of them, the, the amount of variability is, is fast. OK, so. Um, uh, so um, I, I invite folks to um, take a look at the this uh, uh, Micron's data set. Um, it's, uh, I think, the largest one that's been collected to date. Um, I think the, uh, um, the SEM folks have been able to produce a, another data set, which is pretty close recently. Um, and I'm really excited about the ability um, of the technologies to, to, to start looking at um, um, at smaller volumes across um, various uh, individuals um, uh, soon, um, as well as uh, move towards larger data sets. Um, OK, so let's let's look um, at uh, what is in store for the future, um, what, what it takes to make large volumes routine. So um, uh, this is data about the, um, uh, the IARPA data set, which was um, the millimeter cubed image in 2018. So just some specs here. Um, they acquired it uh, at the Allen Brain Institute um, at 80 to 120 megapixels per second across four nodes, and that was about six months of imaging. Um, acquired 26,500 sections there, um, which produced 125 million images at 2.2 petabytes. Um, I think the really interesting thing here is actually the loss rate, the section loss rate, and um, the re-imaging rate. Um, this is, I think, unique to TEM, um, and uh, 
uh, you know, there's questions as to what does that do in terms of traceability of um, axons and being able to to, to um, identify, you know, unique volumes. And um, uh, but I I do think uh, um, the the reimaging was re really really helpful uh, in, in that case um, where where we do have um, uh, um, uh, potential to. Uh, to 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 reconstruct some aspects of of uh, lost sections, and um, and uh, one thing that they worked on really carefully there was to um, make sure that when they had losses, they were limited to maybe one section at a time, and um, for the most part, um, the the losses were kind of a one section at a time type type of thing. Um, there was one one block where I think uh, there was uh, maybe six or seven that were lost in a row, and that actually caused the total volume to be split at at that location. Um, since then, um, multiple large volumes have also been acquired. So I think they did another couple that were in the sort of tens of thousands kind of range. Uh, and we're pretty optimistic that volumetric imaging becomes routine. So um, where, where do we go from here? And um, I, I'm really excited because um, uh, what we've been trying to do here is to make this a uh, commoditized technology. So something that, um, let's say, a young researcher Who's just starting out? Um, you know, they, they can only get like an R21, which isn't that big, maybe under a million dollars. Um, how, how can they get an instrument um, that can do large volumes really, really quickly, or maybe a bunch of small volumes, um, uh, but uh, have have the efficiency to to collect across individuals? Um, so I'm just presenting this here as um, kind of some order of magnitude types of uh, considerations for what it takes to to, to do a whole um, whole brain. Um, so you know the the, the original um, uh, Rosetta Stone was the uh, the nematode nervous system, and uh, th this was uh, solved pretty pretty early on. Three hundred two neurons, and the number of synapses is about seven seventy five hundred. Um, and um, you know, uh, folks moved on to bigger volumes such as the fruit fly brain. There's a hemi brain uh, that was done at Genalia, and that one uh, is a fantastic data set. Uh, that one was acquired over two years, and I think it wasn't it wasn't super huge. It was like um, uh, maybe some tens of terabytes, um, but um, uh, the volume here is, uh, you know, an order of magnitude, a couple orders of magnitude larger, um, with um, you know, uh, 10, 10 million synapses ish. Um, zebrafish here move, moves on by another couple orders of magnitude, and then we're start, starting to look at things like the mouse brain and and the the, the um, baby mouse, and um, this is uh, right now the holy grail for the industry, and um, you know we we've been running numbers on this, and and we think we can do it with a hundred of our type of microscopes at the at the rate that we can do it uh, per, per 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 machine, um, and it might take us a year or two. So I think it's definitely within reach, and and from a cost standpoint, it's actually not not insanely large uh, to to do that with TEM. Um, and uh, just to give an idea of how far off we are from human brain, <laughs> this is just massive, massively larger. Um, you know, we're talking like six or seven orders of magnitude. Um, and uh, you know, when when we were doing gene sequencing, we were looking at okay, how fast can we make these machines? And um, the uh, um, you know the first machines we were doing were maybe like a thousand times faster, hundred hundred to a thousand times faster. And uh, when 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 that com company uh, shut down. Uh, we had reached uh, one in ten. Uh, a, I think uh, we, we'd 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 reached uh, one hundred thousand times faster, and we were like, okay, you know, this this can be used for neuroscience, um, and uh, and we got to a million with with this product um, series. Um, so, uh, what will it take to get to you know <laughs> this? Uh, I'm not really sure. I think it's going to take new technologies um, and uh, or new abilities to parallelize um, or combination technologies. But um, uh, it's really fun and interesting to think about uh, what um, what the uh, landscape might look like to reach uh, um, you know uh, a billion cubic millimeters um, and uh, uh, and what, what that might um, you know deliver to us in terms of uh, of learning. Okay, so um, you know that's that's uh, the exascale and actually potentially beyond, um, and uh, and so um, I I guess I'll close here just uh, by just reiterating that um, you know Blade uh, from from Voxa is a powerful platform that that we um, that we've designed for next generation science. Um, and so it's uh, in summary uh, really fast. I think it's um, one of the fastest uh, types of systems right now. And uh, right now there's a uh, the the world's fastest EM center. 
um, is at Princeton and they have four of our nodes and they currently have the cap capability to deliver um, a real 1500 megapixels per second. That's pretty exciting. Um, and um, so I think scalability is there um, and it's, it's starting to get demonstrated. Um, uh, a second major point uh, just to take home here is that uh, archival media is uh, forgiving of mistakes. I think it's really important to be able to go back in and look. Um, we'll, we'll miss stuff. And the first, you, you know, the, these current generations of hardware are um, needing to, um, um, you know, but by necessity uh, have their limitations. Um, but the future hardware um, can potentially unlock more. And uh, having the media in an archival state, uh, I think, would is is really critical to to be able to go back and look again. Um, the automation is really critical to, for the speed. And um, what what the reason I got into biology from uh, physical sciences was really that I, I I felt that biologists were spending all their time um, uh, fighting against instruments, and so um, I I thought that it was uh, pretty important to uh, free the researcher to focus on um, more important things. Um, because they have all the interesting problems. Um, so things like experiment design, data crunching, and, and optimizations. Um, and, and then finally, um, like supercomputing, um, we, we want the systems to be affordable and incrementally scale with the lab's growing needs. So um, we're, we're optimistic that uh, TEM-based imaging uh, opens up uh, broad new avenues for creative experiments at uh, massive scale. Uh, so with that, um, thanks everyone for listening. I really appreciate the opportunity to share what we're doing. and. Uh, um, look uh, forward to conversations with all of you. So um, feel free to ask questions and um, open it up to the floor. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, OK, I guess uh, the floor is open for questions. And I'm definitely not going to be the first one to ask questions. I see that uh, Nicola already has a question up there. Hi there. Very up. nice talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank um, you. That's very exciting. So when um, Rodney Douglas and Kevin Martin um, worked at the scale of the millimeter, they ended up with the canonical circuit in the brain. And then 40% of it was left as called the dark matter of the brain. And so the, the main concept that came out of their studies was we have repeated models. The circuit is everywhere the same. Now you're speaking about the next jump when we're going to go to the whole brain. Um, people have already looked painstakingly in trying to trace single neurons, spending a whole PhD for like 15 neuron uh, cells to be traced from the front to the back to, of the brain. Um, what do you think are the main possible discoveries that are waiting there on the other side when we get to the larger volume, the whole mouse brain? What is there that has not been discovered with, you know, the canonical circuit? Um, well, uh, you're asking a um, an applied physicist here, so um, I will have to qualify um, my my answer as <laughs> uh, conjecture and um, just looking at things from the outside, right? So I'm a tool builder um, uh, um, with great interest in uh, uh, in in the the neuroscience. Um, so. Um, in my experience, at least looking at physical sciences, is like you don't know until you look. Like things like if you look, uh, you know, folks, uh, you know, solved the uh, quantum mechanics um, uh, 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 equations, right? For for uh, for for the atom, and then they look inside, and there's all these bizarre structures uh, with um, uh, that are sub angstrom that um, are actually not supported by the mathematics and, and new mathematics has to come, right? So um, I, I'm a big proponent of saying, you just have to look. So I think you're, you're kind of with me there on that. Um, there is so much variability in com communication. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, sugar, sugar channels, you know, and then there's like the kinases and, and uh, d different types of neurotransmitters. Main neurotransmitters have been identified, but, um, you know, everybody thinks, uh, you know, you, you have action potentials, um, and that's maybe a very simplistic model. I think that there's uh, many, many hierarchies in there. So what I'm really interested in, and, and maybe folks like, you know, Boyden um, uh, uh, have, have, have echoed this uh, too, and that's that, um, that we need to know, like, where are all the proteins, you know, what are um all the hierarchies and um uh you know and so you know i'm interested in the mesoscale for example like what's happening uh, at the organelle level um cell types i think is huge like pe people haven't really been looking at like you know distribution of cell types you know they 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 have been extrapolating you know so um i i remember when i did my phd 
um, uh, we were in ultra high resolution and we said, uh, you know, we were looking at like one, one nanometer, uh, sub nanometer down to almost one angstrom. And uh, my professor um, would always make this point that every single ultra high resolution image that has ever been published could fit on the head of a pin. Um, and that's barely anything. So, um, so I don't know, uh, like, so conjecturing here, <laughs> I would just say that um, I think people are thinking very simplistically and, uh, and answering this question before it's really been asked of, um, you know, okay, I have a canonical circuit and saying it's done. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, really similar to also, um, like Lin Linus Pauling was a big fan of, uh, you know, he was a big crystallographer and uh, the um, Andy Shekman, uh, an Israeli physicist, he discovered quasicrystals and uh, Linus Pauling didn't think it was possible. And uh, he was completely resistant to it and, and uh, um, said, you know, this, this, this couldn't be, uh, there, there is no way you can have, uh, you know, these, these, these odd Fibonacci type, type, type crystallography orders. Um, and uh, he had to pass away and the entire opposition left when he, when, when he passed away. And then it became known that, that this was actually real. Um, and, uh, and finally the Nobel Prize was awarded. So uh, my sense just, you know, as a, as, as a scientist and a researcher is that, uh, the, that you just have to look and you have to look at the data and the data will tell you. Um, and, uh, and so um, my, my view is to open this up uh, to, 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 to people to, to, to start looking at the territories once the maps are provided. So ultimately, I'm just a cartographer and hopefully helping people bring back, um, you know, uh, uh, valuable maps that they can interpret. I agree with everything that you said. Uh, if you allow me a second question, though, um, it's really nice that you rose um, uh, Ed Boyden up. So EM has the problem of the glutaraldehydes that makes everything not very perme permeable to staining. So mm -hmm. that's another reason why you need the small slices. Mm -hmm. Boyden, with the expansion, allows access to the proteins, plus makes them visible by shifting the scale. So which technique you think has more chances to catch up with that positioning? They just started publishing classification of synaptic densities with expansion microscopy. Yeah, um, I, I think co-localization correlative is critical. Um, I, actually, um, you know, I, about 10 years ago, I, I, um, uh, we actually put in a proposal with Boyden on, on this technology to try and identify the proteins. And um, I think in part, uh, expansion came out of some of those discussions. Maybe, you know, probably he was thinking about it earlier than that as well, because he, he had a lot of uh, understanding of, um, of uh, uh, tags and stuff. But I think fundamentally, um, th this is a sample prep problem um, and uh, how you treat, um, you know, post-processed uh, samples and um and and so if you remember that um uh that slide here where i showed um this this pipeline here and so the preparation of the sections i think there's a lot of opportunity there um you know we have to kind of unlock this chicken and egg type of problem where we go from uh um uh, uh you know not being able to get a lot of voxels you know to now we can get a lot of voxels and we think that now the um uh, the attention should focus back onto sample preparation a little bit um but things like um okay what kind of um uh, combinatorial stains can you do what kind of functional imaging can you do before uh in light microscopy and correlate that to the em i think that's absolutely critical um so part of the IALPA project was to you know try and do some uh some uh, functional work before um uh, um, and correlating that to, 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 to the neuronal circuits in, in, in the TM. And I think um, that, that's actually incomplete. I think that there needs to be much work there in connecting um, the, those two and um, doing some ground truth kind of work to, to say, okay, you know, what, what sort of preparations can we do to, 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 to get, uh, you know, information out at the, uh, at the uh, uh, synapse level and correlate that. Um, but I, I do think there are still opportunities to, to do stains, um, even with the glutaraldehyde. Um, I think uh, they're, they're um, uh, um, you know, even staining surfaces is, is, is still going to give you some information. There's some, some percentage that, that you'll be able to get, get um, post-stain uh, data on. So I think there's, there's a few vectors that, that haven't been explored yet, and um, we'll, we'll see um, where, where that's going to go. Mm -hmm. I want to quickly read out a question that Alexander McLean wrote into the chat. He wrote, uh, is there still room for more improvement in sequential speed 
or are we already approaching the maximum limits and the future direction is in multiple parallel microscopes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, there's this thing called the con conservation of brightness. And uh, there's different types of sources that are various brightnesses. Um, and so it turns out the brightest source in our solar system is not the gun. Uh, I mean, not, not the sun. It's the electron gun and a particular type of electron gun, which is a cold field emitter. I think the uh, shot key might not be as uh, bright as the sun. I'm not sure. Maybe Ken, Ken can chime in on that. It might be actually brighter than the sun. Um, but what that is, is the amount of uh, current that you can get out per solid angle. And um, um, so through uh, the performance of the microscope is limited by the gun. And um, what that is, is how many electrons you can get into a, a, a certain probe area um, per, per unit time uh, coherently so you can form an image with it. And, um, and so for a single instrument, there's only so many electrons you can get into a certain area that you spread out the beam over. And so there's this critical parameter, which is um, electrons per square angstrom or electrons per square nanometer. And that's your detection limit. So um, at some point, you start getting really noisy images. And we don't know how noisy they can get before you start losing information. But currently, the industry loves to have beautiful images. That's what gets grants. Um, so they like to have a lot of fill. Um, I think we, we've got probably a factor of two to four, maybe, maybe even 10. Uh, in terms of noise in, uh, and, and extractable information. So maybe there's room uh, of a factor of two to four in terms of speed from where we are. Um, and it's just like, you know, a computer may be able to pick out signal from the noise better than a human eye can. Uh, but I don't know, I might challenge that uh, because the eye is very, very good at interpreting patterns. Um, but uh, at Halcyon Molecular, we looked at this and we were like, okay, you know, we're going to have to paralyze really soon. And uh, we realized that uh, TEM was, uh, despite being a more complicated instrument, it was actually a more parallelizable uh, motif. And the reason was because um, the detector could be uh, parallelized um, at the same time. Uh, and that, that uh, you know, to reiterate what I mentioned in my talk, um, that came from an industry that was much, much bigger, which is the, the, um, the imaging industry, people making cameras. Uh, and so we can leverage um, you know, the, these serial improvements um, like uh, using Cricut here um, with uh, with that, but we must always respect conservation of brightness. Mm -hmm. And Ken has turned his hand up for a while. Hi, Ken. Hey, sorry about uh, the wrong numbers there on the on the on the uh, <laughs> neurons. Uh, thanks for the correction. So it's a uh, it's a uh, hundred uh, wait ten to the seven right uh, neurons in in the human brain. Uh, no, no, no. I was talking about the volume. I, oh, I the volume. Oh, sorry, uh, millimeter cube. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, 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 it's 10 million cubic it's, millions. It's, it's enormous, so. <laughs> it's a ways off, right? <laughs> uh, uh, so fantastic stuff. I'm always impressed by uh, by this stuff and it, it just seems to get better and faster every time I, I hear you talk. Uh, uh, I, had a, I had a couple of, uh, uh, of questions because you're, you're, uh, you're bringing up the whole mouse brain. Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so one before I go to that is uh, a little update on your thoughts on uh, uh, cutting thicker and uh, and doing TM tomography, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, also just the uh, uh, a quick question on what your thoughts might be on cutting whole mouse brains for uh, and collecting them using this. Okay. Yeah. This is this is great, and I guess as a preface to uh, to the Berlin conference coming up, right? Are, are you going? Yeah. Yeah. You got to be there, right? <laughs> oh no, I can't. I can't make it, but um, oh, I'm really sorry. excited to to hear about it. But um, okay, so um, I am firmly believing that um, uh, that it's too hard to cut, and uh, it was really hard to cut uh, ten thousand sections, right? Uh, we we lost quite a, quite a bit. Our team um uh at alan brain really you know like we were, we're not sample prep people that the i would give credit to to alan brain for uh, the gargantuan work that they did really was was in the sample prep um uh that that was really really key uh, along with supporting you know the the um the imaging um but uh i think uh you know probably the practical limits of that without loss is something like a hundred thousand sections because of human reasons it's it's not truly automated yet uh, despite your incredible <laughs> efforts at automating things um, and um, I think it needs to be easier and better um, and more robotic um, and so one place we can go 
Um, and I, I think we've talked about this at a few of the meetings, but uh, I'm not sure if it's a popular idea yet. Uh, but I do think we need to go thicker. And the reason is that we can increase the reliability of cuts by two orders of magnitude. So we can go to a million probably, uh, maybe even 10 million if we go to like 100 nanometer cuts um, from 30. And that's hard for TEM because TEM needs to somehow reconstruct this, uh, this stuff. Um, uh, and SEM can depth section. TEM can depth section, there's a few ways, but it's still slow. Um, so I would borrow from the playbook of, um, of genomics and say, hey, let's throw more, more computers at the problem. And so my view is that tilts are the way to go. And so we can do depth sectioning through tilts um, and there's various approaches to that, but the reconstruction methods cannot be the standard, um, uh, when you call it the, uh, the back projection, the, the brute force back projection methodologies. I don't think they're gonna work. It's gotta be something else like a machine learning assisted approach or something. Um, the distortions are different across extremely large areas and um, uh, you know the, the information is different and we need to know what information we're trying to measure too. So uh, you know this is like saying, okay, you can always build a faster clock, right? But, um, or a more precise clock, but maybe, maybe you need something that's more, uh, that has less jitter, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's a kind of, um, uh, and that's in the context of like maritime sailing, right? And being able to measure long, longitude. So um, barring, a, barring from that, that kind of story, um, I think we need new technologies for reconstruction uh, to solve this, but I don't think it's intractable and I think it's doable with a small number of tilts. I don't think it needs to be a lot. Um, so I think, you know, if we've effectively made, you know, more or less uh, made imaging free uh, in, in relation to the other components of the system, um, then we can dedicate single microscopes to specific tilts and then recover are, data that way. Are there any, uh, oh, interesting, uh, are there any proof of concept uh, data sets that uh, um, that you're willing to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I think, uh, there's work being done in the area, but it's okay. hard. It's difficult. Um, so this is, um, to me, a next frontier. And, um, I think it's an unlocking technology. Um, nice. so, uh, you know, so we'll see, but, you know, it could be that, that SEM actually might have a leg up on, on it for, for this particular thing. Um, because um, thin sectioning is, is important. But there may be even hybrid approaches where, you know, one doesn't actually fully thin section, right? One does a projection and then does like a, you know, a partial thin section or something and get, get information that way, like wherever confounding information is. So I, I think there's hybrid approaches too that nobody's really been looking at. So, um, you know, the data sets are extremely large, right? So, so you have to pick a way to go and, 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 and run with it, but, um, my, my view is that doing small data sets and uh, lots of individuals is, is, is a great way to go right now and not going after the giant data sets because um, yeah. I think we'll learn a lot more uh, leveraging the speed that we have now in the tools across different individuals um, and different technologies. Awesome, thanks. Thanks for the question, Ken. Let's see, Ken, you still have your hand up, but I guess that's not for a second question, right? um anyone else got any remaining questions here we've actually we're slightly over time already so we should probably close out soon so i'd like to just uh ask anyone if you have any last minute questions anything you really want to ask a pressing question one or two we can do those but then we should really let chris get on with his very busy day so no further questions at this time okay then we are perfectly on time and Allison already had to jump off, so I'm just going to close it. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, this was, of course, really interesting. I mean, I'm amazed by this stuff. I, I think it's super, super important. This is how you make these ripples that actually cause something in the future to happen, right? Yeah. It's, um, yeah, exactly. It's been a pleasure to be working on it. And so, yeah, uh, thanks, everybody. I hope we see you guys again at the next keynote and uh, have a wonderful time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Till next time.